Hello and welcome to the Small Business Briefing. I'm Brian Kelly, the CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Miller, Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Communications at SBAN. We appreciate you tuning in today. We have uh, quite a show planned and we we're going to start with some exciting news. The Gordie Howe Bridge is getting close to having the spans connecting Detroit and Canada connected. So tell us a little bit more about this, Brian. Yeah, this is um, this is a, a a project long since supported by the Small Business Association of Michigan, going back well over a decade, and it takes that long for a project like this to to come to fruition. And um, and so this uh, and the reason that we're so interested in uh, the connection, an additional connection to Canada, is because most people don't realize this, but most of uh, most importers or net, most exporters, I should say. Um, that operate out of Michigan are small businesses. Of course, we know about the giants, you know, the auto companies that are obviously major exports, exporters account for, for a big percentage of the volume. If you were to look at count the number of companies, most are actually small businesses that trade with Canada. And it's a really big part of our, uh, our economy here. So the Gordie Howe Bridge named for, of course, uh, the great Gordie Howe who was born in Canada, but was, uh, but was on the Red Wings all those years the um that that uh, this bridge is a um it's a, it's about 85 feet from the two sides connecting so it's really really close now 85 feet might sound like a long way away but keep in mind this mi this bridge is a mile and it's the um it's a mile and a half when you include the approaches to the bridge so the last 85 feet is really really close and it, when it's done when it's completed it will be the longest cable stay bridge in North America. And uh, so cable stay is kind of like suspension. If you think about the, like the, the Mackinac Bridge, you have those suspension bridges on either side of the deck. Cable stay um, goes to from a single point on each tower to uh, to the deck in the center. And uh, so it's not, it's not on both sides, it's in the middle. It's a more kind of efficient way and it'll allow for a, um, a single span over the water. There are no piers in the water. So that means that ships going through, I uh, think about what happened in, um, in Philadelphia, that couldn't happen here because there are no piers in the Detroit River. This is a cable stay bridge that spans the entire, um, the, uh, the entire span of the river. And that is a, uh, which is technically by the way, a channel. Uh, but the, uh, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing project. I don't know if anybody's been you know, on uh, over in that part of Detroit, you know, down toward um, Southwest Detroit, that it, it's it's a marvel. You see these pictures of it, you don't realize how big it really is until you get up close to it. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, to tour it with um, with um, former Ambassador Jim Blanchard, former Governor also of Michigan, um, but former Ambassador to uh, to Canada, David Jacobson, another former Ambassador. And uh, went over to the Canadian side and the U.S. side, and um, it it is a marvel. It's the sort of thing I think probably in a few years we'll probably have license plates with this bridge on it. So it's uh, it's really fun to see it come uh, come to life, and it'd be something that's really quite important to our economy moving forward. Well, very cool. We can't wait to see it um, come to completion. Uh, we have a special guest joining us today from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Kina Player. And so, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you for a conversation with her. All right, very good. So, uh, so we we do what we have been doing here now uh, for over about the last year is we like to to feature something really cool and interesting and helpful that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is doing uh, for their members, for those who have um, who have uh, insurance, it could be through an SBM Blue Cross plan or any other Blue Cross plan across the um, across the landscape. So, Kina, before we get started, because I know we're going to talk, talk about uh, spine and joint care. I uh, I saw just recently a, um, a uh, I don't know, I guess you'd say a, a meme, but it really, it really struck me. It said that if, uh, if I sing the word hello to you and you think Lionel Richie and not Adele, that your back probably hurts. And I thought, ah, oh, that just really speaks to me. I didn't give Kina any warning that I tell dad jokes. Uh, Kina, welcome to uh, to SPM. Let's start out with a little bit about what you do at um, at uh, Blue Cross. Yes, absolutely. I am a solution owner for our spine and joint care program, and this is really a provider facing program, and it helps 
to ensure adherence to evidence-based guidelines and clinically appropriate care, which can help lead to outcomes, great outcomes to reduce the cost of care for our members. This program actually ensures care follows those established clinical guidelines to promote appropriate treatment for our members. So if, 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 as we move forward on this uh, or ad, advance this conversation, so in, in, in ensuring that treatment is necessary, safe, being performed according to um, uh, standards in the appropriate setting uh, is uh, is important. So like, but what's the how? How are you doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So Blue Cross works with Turning Point Healthcare Solutions to perform our prior authorization services for our muscular skeletal surgical and related procedures. This program really empowers collaboration of patients, payers, providers to really focus on quality and affordability of those healthcare services. It is a comprehensive solution and it integrates evidence-based utilization management pathways, side of service optimization and specialized peer-to-peer -peer engagement. It also includes advanced analytics and reporting to promote overall health management of our members. By working with Turning Point on our utilization management services for orthopedic, pain, and spine procedures, it truly helps to drive that adherence to evidence-based treatment guidelines and evaluate surgical procedures prescribed by providers as clinically appropriate and safe. So how, how does it connect in? So how does Turning Point connect in with, with my doctors? It, you know, people have a primary care physician or somebody that's kind of helping them with this. How does that integrate together? Yeah, great question. Um, at Blue Cross, um, our goal is to ensure that our members receive that necessary care they need in a timely manner and in the most appropriate setting, ultimately leading to the best outcome. Turning Point is a provider-facing program, and it ensures evidence-based guidelines and clinical appropriate care, which leads to those desired outcomes and reduces cost of care for our members. How Turning Point accomplishes this is really behind the scenes with the providers. They follow those established clinical guidelines, side of service optimization, detailed coding reviews, and same specialty surgeons for reviews and peer-to-peer -peer discussions. Many of those doctors are former presidents of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And all of this takes place in as little as 2.6 days. So how about, I don't want to take for granted that people know what utilization management really means. Could you flesh that out a bit? Oh, absolutely. So utilization management works to really deliver high value utilization management programs across local and national markets to our customers. They do this by a couple of things, ensuring that quality oversight for clinical appropriateness and regulatory requirements are being met, um, creating programs for cost containment. Um, managing those operations of medical, behavioral health, inpatient and outpatient prior authorizations and also referral forms, and then processing those pre-off cases and making sure that they're in compliance with regulatory guidelines and contractual obligations. This program actually works to reduce the clinical weight and improve safety and keep healthcare affordable. 15.7% of healthcare spending is really attributed to clinical weight. And that includes the failure of care and delivery, care coordination, and over treatment. So with utilization uh, management in, in, uh, in general, but maybe even specifically the turning point that we've been talking about, like who's, who's it available to? Is it only certain plans, certain like of, of uh, somebody at Blue Cross today how do they know this is for them? Yeah, absolutely. So Blue Cross has many UN programs in place for our group customers, both small, large, and also fully insured and our self-funded customers. 
um, the UM services provided specifically by Turning Point are included for our fully insured groups and also available as a buyout for our ASD self-funded PPO commercial groups as part of our spine and joint program. Additionally, it's available to all Medicare Plus Blue and BCN Advantage, all BCN commercial, ASD and fully insured, as well as PPO commercial fully insured groups. Self-funded PPO commercial groups have the option to buy into this program as well. All right, excellent, very much. Well, thanks, Kina, for joining us today, and thanks for the long-term partnership and the great work that Blue Cross is doing, and of course, as usual, ahead of the curve. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks, Kina. I did share a link so that if you're interested, you can learn more about this program through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. You know, Sarah, I should have probably mentioned, too, that huge, huge news yesterday that we had heard earlier that, CE that Blue Cross CEO Dan Lepp had, was going to retire. That was announcement was made earlier. And then there was a search and Trisha Keith hired from within. So has been with Blue Cross for a long time, highly, highly respected in, uh, in the industry, a real, um, both insurance and, but also like operational expert. Somebody really knows the ins and outs. And, um, and so I would, with, with a hire like that, I would not expect a promotion like that. I should say, I would not expect Blue Cross to miss a beat. Uh, and, and what is a momentous uh, change. You know, in 40 years, they've only had three CEOs. Um, so a lot of people look at Blue Cross and like, you know, how is that uh, insurance company grown to be so dominant in the in the marketplace? Part of it is is consistent leadership over a long period of time. It's just very unusual for a company to, to only have three CEOs. But I think that you know, SBM kind of has a record like that, though. I think about the last couple of CEOs of SBM were were, long, were pretty long term. Also, um, maybe I'll join the ranks of that. But that's a um, but that is a, a big, big change in one that. Um, but, but what the way they handled it and and how they chose, I think, really will allow for um, a strong amount of continuity and, and really no disruption at all in uh, any sort of transition. And yet infuse a lot of energy for the future and where they go from here. Absolutely. I'm glad you uh, remembered to point that out and we congratulate her on her new position. All right, let's talk about a new poll. It's a New York Times Siena poll and it includes some results from Senate races around the country and the presidential election. It looks like this poll is suggesting that it's shaping up to be a ticket splitting year. Yeah, you know, we always in the, in the past we always think about like wave elections. There's going to be a wave election this way, a wave election that way, and that the only thing that really I've I've uh, I, I've come to expect about each election cycle is that it will look nothing like the one before. So uh, every two years, an election cycle that just seems so different in terms of the makeup of the turnout, the issues that drive people, the type of candidates that win, all of that stuff is is very different. Um, the, so the uh, this Times Siena poll that was uh, was published looked at uh, several swing states, and um, the uh, it it confirms still that um, that candidate Donald Trump is is doing well in these election in these uh, swing states against um, against um, the incumbent President Biden. So the um, that lead had you know it's not like a huge lead in most of these states, but still it's been consistent enough over the last year to where um, there aren't too many people out there in the polling world that think it's a blip, that this is uh, something that's really kind of ingrained. Um, what was a little more surprising from these results is that um, in the U.S. Senate races, in some of those states, some of those same swing states have active Senate races. So remember, this is the same poll asking the same people questions about different races. How are you going to vote for president? How are you going to vote for Senate? And um, the uh, and they were uh, in those states, um, oddly, the Senate question was not pulled in Michigan, although the presidential one was, or at least they didn't publish it. Um, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada. And um, in those races, the Democrat running for Senate is leading. So in all four of those races, 
uh, former President Trump is leading the presidential election, the Democrats running for U.S. Senate statewide are leading. And, and what's maybe a little bit more surprising is you could really dig into this poll a little bit more. What you find is that the um, the the way or the coalition, the group of people that are creating the majority for um, for this for the Senate Democratic candidates looks very kind of traditional. It looks like just the regular way that a person who's running as a Democrat for statewide office would kind of build their support. It's the same groups of people. What, but the math really looks different on the presidential race. A lot of the, the base of the Democratic Party is, in other words, for these Senate races, seems to be holding together, but not holding together in the presidential race. It is a, um, it's a, it's a highly unusual uh, type of a scenario. It's the first a wide scale look at this particular issue that I've seen in um, in this election. So um, that I thought was pretty noteworthy, um, and um, and it does have ram. It definitely has ramifications down ticket, uh, but it's not. But it's just that fact alone that you have uh, the same people that are saying, "Yep, they're going to vote for a candidate on this side of the aisle, and then another candidate on that side of the aisle." Uh, would suggest that it's probably not a wave year as much as people looking at which candidate um, they like better and um, or which candidate they dislike the least, uh, as it might be. So um, that um, we're trained to think in terms of waves. This is really a pretty good indication that this might be a much more complex uh, electoral map and so that would have ramifications on state offices here and elsewhere. Um, at the end of the day, though, Michigan is going to be um, essentially ground zero for this presidential election. I believe the presidential spend and presence will be um, will be deafening by the time the election rolls around. And so it probably will have more impact on all the other races in the state because of that volume being turned up so loud. Uh, or as I expect, it would be turned up pretty loud. But um, but this uh, willingness to ticket split is, um, I would say generally, if it holds up, again, this is one poll, but if it holds up or multiple polls at the same time in different states, um, that uh, it's, it's an unusual, not an unheard of, but an unusual phenomenon. All right, well, certainly this will not be the last we talk about these races. Um, let's cover a couple of issues with the automotive industry. The first of is um, some Ford electric vehicle losses that are mounting, pretty staggering losses. Um, tell me more about those and what that means for us here in Michigan. Yeah, when I first read this, um, Ford's first quarter results, when I read the number, how much they're losing per electric vehicle that they sold, I I. I thought it must be a typo because the number was a staggering $100,000. But there are multiple outlets that were reporting, reputable, reputable business um, um, uh, publications, like that's that's what is happening right now. And it's and at that at that level, we've covered before that the the electric vehicles um, that you know there was some demand that was growing um, in previous years. That they were investing heavily in it, they were going to have losses for a while. But the um, the combustible engine and the hybrid uh, sales would cover those losses and then some. At this level, though, at the first quarter level, it would it would it would take it would wipe out all the profit from the more traditional uh, divisions and lines. It's the reason why you see uh, Ford uh, cutting back. They they're keeping their partnerships in place, but like the, the the plant in Marshall being cut about in half in terms of what its production capacity will be to build uh, batteries, it's a um, the the reason that is necessary is they just simply can't afford um, can't afford that. And there's a couple of things that are happening. Um, the um, the prices have come down, so you know there's a lot of people going after this relatively new market. And the and it's a lot of competition. So the price per vehicle being sold is um, is lower than what an electric vehicle would have been back when it was like a novelty um, 
and and they weren't kind of readily more available. So the prices uh, compared to years ago have come down, but also at the same time, the demand has come down quite a bit. And so there's this big infrastructure built and not much volume or demand. And, um, and the fact that there are investment decisions being curtailed right now would say that they, they do not believe that this is just a temporary thing, that uh, the, the market for electric vehicles is just going to grow slower than what was anticipated before. And um, and so they cannot continue to lose money at that type of a uh, uh, type of a rate. So there, this is a, um, I mean, everybody knew they were losing money on um, on electric vehicles, but just that level, it makes it m much more clear why it was necessary to um, uh, to to make plans and in these investment decisions, such as in Marshall, Michigan. All right, let's move over to General Motors. We've talked about their headquarters change, but now they're making some new investments out west. Tell us more. Yeah, you know, there's so much talk about electric vehicles, but um, but don't forget that that automation and self-driving cars, like there's still a a very intense competition for how quickly that technology can move ahead, and uh, a lot of the um, engineering and development work has happened in the past has happened in Michigan for this particular type of work. Um, the uh, General Motors actually just um, just uh, opened a, uh, a tech center, about 200 people that are focused on this area in Silicon Valley. And, um, and it's, it, and it's not, you know, it's not terribly um, surprising that, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a group of, uh, of people that are, you know, that, that are some of the the best in the world when it comes to um, when it comes to, uh, to tech and developing tech and this type of um, programming and technology. Uh, but what also is happening out there? It used to be like you know these are not individuals that would would want to work for like a legacy car company. But a lot of the tech companies have been laying people off over the last year, and um, and I think that the uh, in the automotive industry in this case General Motors. Um, has seen an opportunity to meet some of the needs of the organization, but also to scoop up some great talent that otherwise would never have been available. When you look at these tech companies, they're laying people off and um, it's, it's not been insignificant. And this is kind of the Mecca for that, uh, for that type of worker in the country. So uh, it hurts a little bit, you know, to see that type of um, investment happening so far away from Michigan uh, but the world is changing and it's changing quickly. Um, and uh, I think General Motors is in a position where they really, they've got to go to where the talent is um, and uh, and not fall behind on the, on the technology. All right. Um, one of our final stories today is about a tariff announcement that was made regarding Chinese imports. Yeah, this was, um, this is one of those rare issues where, um, a policy was started under President Trump and wholeheartedly embraced and taken to the next level by President Biden. Um, these two don't agree on anything, but Chinese tariffs, they both agree on. Um, and so, um, and, and, and actually I, I, you do kind of see like a, um, I, I think you'll see some escalation in that. Who, who's willing to go higher on these uh, between these two as they approach uh, the election this fall. So, um, the uh, the one that's gotten the most attention is the tariffs on electric vehicles. So electric vehicles from China will carry a hundred percent tariff. So they will, whatever they come in, whatever tag they come in at, uh, the full price of the vehicle has to be paid as a tariff before it can be sold here, and um, that's a um, that's a pretty that's a pretty aggressive or significant uh, change. The um, many of the others are staggered. They take effect between the next couple of years, um, a sixty, um, and uh, but but they're but they're more than. Uh, President Trump was did a sixty percent tariff, um, and it was a pretty broad um, uh, set of items. Um, so this this really does kind of raise the uh, the ante on that. Um, let me see here. Um, 
I wanted to, here we go. The, um, just to, to give you an idea of the, of the things that, uh, that would be impacted, um, port cranes, medical products, solar cells, and critical minerals, um, are other things in addition. And this is a, um, when I looked at that list, most of them are actually uh, probably industry here in Michigan is happy about this because, first of all, you have um, you have uh, declining demand within the uh, for electric vehicles. So the idea of you know Chinese electric vehicles you know, flooding the market um, is something that um, that I you know I think that what we started this conversation with it would make it would kind of exacerbate that uh, those challenges for the domestic industry. It's kind of a protectionist approach for the industry so the autom uh, um the automotive vehicle or the electric vehicle um is kind of an obvious michigan impact but this is actually one one of the places with striker where uh, medical devices are um, and hospital equipment it's it's huge and uh, medical products are 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 covered under these new uh, tariffs so um solar cells uh, another one where um in uh, in kind of the, the the Bay Area, a lot of the solar technology and manufacturing that happens here in uh, in the Saginaw Bay Area here in Michigan. Um, so several, and then critical minerals. Uh, when you consider that um, that you know mining is back in the UP, and um, and so there is a um, there are several industries that I think when uh, when these tariffs go in place. Now I know there's a bigger debate on are tariffs really good economic policy or not. But from an industry standpoint, I would guess that um, that industry interests in Michigan, those that are kind of running these bigger operations that are affected in these industries, um, are probably pretty happy about that move. Um, but at you know at the end of the day, it probably uh, not probably it does it does add cost, right? It reduces competition, adds cost, and could um, could eventually end up um, working against some of the inflation objectives that. We have in terms of keeping uh, costs down, so it's a complicated world out there. It keeps on getting more complicated, and um, in this uh, this tariff announcement, while it wasn't totally unexpected, I think the scale at which it uh, was uh, was announced was uh, was at least to me it was a bit surprising. All right, well, thanks for the update there. I do want to make a hard pivot here. And remind everyone that SBAM hosts a small business summit, an annual meeting every year. It's going to be June 13th. I think we have talked about it a little bit on this show before, um, but early bird ticket pricing does end tomorrow. So if you're tuned in and you have not yet registered, I encourage you to go get your tickets now before prices increase. It's a full day event. We have a full exhibit hall. We have four express learning sessions, lots of time for you to connect with your peers, there's a lounge, we have lunch, and then of course our keynote speaker is Jacob Brown, who's going to talk about embracing fear and failing forward. So you can visit our website, it's right on the homepage. Join us June 13th, it's a fantastic day, uh, but get your, get your tickets now before the prices increase. So that is all we have for you today. We'll be back here Monday at three o'clock. Excellent, thanks everybody, see you next week.